early July on the Grand Banks, six miles outside Canada's 200-mile limit. The Federal Fisheries ship, Cape Roger, is on patrol. We're on the tail of the Grand Banks, a rich fishing ground just beyond Canada's jurisdiction. A lot of foreign trawlers that are not licensed to fish inside the zone like to fish out here, right along the edge. Sometimes they slip inside. It's the Cape Rogers job to see they don't, to show the flag out here, to discourage overfishing outside the line and catch anyone who cheats across it. One country in particular has been causing big problems, Spain. So the Cape Roger will be keeping a close eye out for the Spanish flag. Now how many boats would you get in uh, concentrated in that area, would you say? Uh, down here on Tilda Bank, it would depend on the time of year. Uh, usually there's a large concentration uh, come around April month. You could get as high as 50, 60 foreign boats in there from each nation. Do you think there's much fish taken down there on, on, the, on the tail? There's very much. Uh, from our inspection reports, there's uh, quite a bit of fish being taken. Uh, with the non-NAFL members, which are vessels, you know, countries that are not a part of NAFL and are unregulated as far as quotas, they're down in this area and uh, they fish unlimited. A lot of, a lot of Sp Spanish boats, is it? Well, that is a, that is a major uh, country that is not part of NAFL. Do you find uh, that there is much cheating going on, uh, sneaking across the line uh, when you call us not around? That's a, that's a difficult one to answer. Uh, usually uh, with the fog and the stormy weather that we have, it's, uh, it's hard to tell for sure, but uh, we believe there is a fair bit. But like I said, it's hard to tell for sure. When the Cape Roger finds the foreign trawlers, Bob Turner and John Taylor are the ones who board and inspect them. But where Spain is concerned, that's easier said than done, as we soon found out. Our first encounter, a set of Spanish pier trawlers, the Alpez and the Avior, eight miles outside the line. A crewman from the Cape Roger hoists the boarding flags, and John Taylor gets on the ship's radio. Avior, 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 this is the CGS Cape Roger, Cape Roger, Cape Roger, and Channel 16. How do you read, over? Hello. Good morning. This is Avior. Over. Avior, this is the Cape Roger. Uh, Roger, sir, I was wondering if we can come over and complete an inspection, over. No, no, on the day, no, on the day. Uh, Avior, this is Cape Roger. Could you come back again, over? Hable, hable español, hable español. Hable español. Negative, sir, negative. I do not speak Spanish. I do not speak Spanish. I was wondering, can we come over and complete an inspection, over? No. No possible entender inglés. English, no possible. Roger, Roger. Can you stand by one over? Okay. They're playing ignorant. That's what they're doing now. I guess they have to swing around and go tomorrow. Get one tomorrow. What's the response you from him? Negative. I do not understand. Not, 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 not possible to come on board. Though. I said not possible, but he also saying uh, you speak Espanol, and then he said uh, not understand English, right? So he's just playing games with us. If it was a game, the Spaniards won. They steamed away, and so did the Cape Roger. Even if the fisheries officers knew a few words of Spanish, it's unlikely they would have gotten any farther. To explain this strange standoff on the high seas, we have to go back a ways. In 1977, after years of relentless overfishing by foreign fleets, Canada declared its 200-mile limit. From now on, any nation that wanted to fish inside this line had to play by Canada's rules. It would have to have a Canadian fishing license and limit its catch to strict quotas 
set down by the Canadian government. The era of overfishing appeared to be at an end. But there was a problem. While most of the Grand Banks could be neatly tucked inside the line, two areas could not. To the north, a small piece of the continental shelf sticks out just beyond the 200 mile limit. It's called the nose of the banks. To the south, a second, larger area, some 7,200 square miles, pushes well outside the line. It's called the tail of the banks. Since fish know nothing about lines drawn on maps, they feed and spawn on the nose and tail of the banks as much as they do inside the 200 mile zone. And so, while Canada can protect its fish stocks inside the limit, when those fish swim outside, they are still prey to uncontrolled overfishing by foreign fleets. Canada foresaw this problem before 1977. At the Law of the Sea Conference, where 200 mile zones were agreed on, Canada tried to claim the nose and the tail areas. It failed. When the Canadian position for this was first being developed, the position was described as 200 miles or the limit of the continental shelf, whichever is the furthest. But when the conference began, it became very quickly uh, evident that nothing beyond 200 miles was going to be acceptable. There were only two countries in the world that really had uh, an interest to the point where they were pushing this position. That was Canada and Argentina. A couple of other countries had zones that could have gone beyond 200 miles, but they weren't really interested in fisheries in that area. They just didn't know enough about their resources. It wasn't of real interest to them. So what you had was roughly 150 countries that said 200 miles is all anybody needs, and two countries, Canada and Argentina, that were pushing hard for the opposite position, and there was no way that those two could work out to our satisfaction. So Canada had to accept the outer limit as being 200 miles, even though that 200 mile line cut across two important fishing areas and left them outside in the high seas and, and open to international fisheries. Among the first to pounce were the Spaniards. Spain's deep sea fleet is made up mostly of pier trawlers. Two ships, sometimes as much as a half a mile apart, towing the same net. The trawl they use is among the biggest in the world. It can scoop up as much as 180 tons of fish in one haul. Three or four sets of piers can scrape a ground clean in a matter of days. When Canada declared its 200 mile limit, Spain applied for and got licenses to fish inside the zone. But things never went smoothly. By 1980, Spanish piers had been caught almost a dozen times, violating Canada's fishing laws, falsely reporting catches, using mesh that was too small. For their part, the Spaniards complained their quotas were too low. So in 1980, Spain returned its licenses and decided to fish outside the zone, on the nose and tail of the banks. They also refused to join NAFO, the Northwest Atlantic Fisheries Organization. NAFO was made up of 18 countries, including Canada, that want to see the fishery properly managed outside the 200 mile limit. The Spanish government, the Spanish authorities, concluded that they could get Canada to give them allocations inside the Canadian 200 mile zone in return for getting Spain to join NAFO. Uh, the Canadian government told them on many occasions we would not pay for them joining an international organization. This was an international responsibility and that we wouldn't pay for them to, ju to do it. But the Spanish authorities up until very recently had for some reason drawn an opposite conclusion that they could actually get us to give them fish in order for them to join the organization. So Spain became a renegade, free to do as it pleased and catch what it wanted. As long as they stayed outside the line, the Spaniards could refuse boarding requests from patrol ships like the Cape Roger. They were under no obligation to obey Canada's rules or NAFO's rules. So they allowed boardings and inspections only when it pleased them. NAFO did warn Spain that for conservation reasons, it should catch no more than 10,000 tons of fish outside the zone. But indications are the Spaniards take twice as much, if not more. 
and they also have a reputation for dumping anything they catch that's not codfish. All that was left for Canada to do was to keep a close watch on the Spaniards on the nose and the tail, board the Spanish trawlers whenever possible, and try and nab anyone who sneaked across the line to fish in Canadian waters. It's a non-stop game of high seas cat and mouse. The tail of the banks is a big area, and the Cape Roger can't cover it without some help. Its radar is limited, so to save time searching for the Spanish ships, an Aurora surveillance aircraft is often called in. What do you find the more efficient system, Bob? Do you find it uh, using your own radar going back and forth, or, or the Aurora? Uh, I think the Aurora will be more efficient. Uh... For a simple reason, it can cover more area in a shorter time than we can. With us, with our radar, uh, we got approximately 15 miles radius we can cover. Uh, if there's a boat 18 miles away from us, we would miss it by three miles, whereas the Aurora flight would, would take it all in. So the Aurora comes in and, and does a search and then reports back to you? Is that what happened? Uh, if we're in the area at the time, the Aurora will talk directly to us, give us the exact positions at the time, and then we can direct our patrol from there. There are a number of Spanish trawlers fishing in clearer weather to the south. The Aurora comes in low to make an exact identification, then radios the information back to the Cape Roger. Okay, Roger, from Canadian Military 108, message follows, you ready to copy, over. Canadian Military 0108, Cape Roger, go ahead, over. Uh, Roger, and we encountered uh, fog north of position of 46 north, 47 west. Contacts south of that area, follow. Four Spanish vessels in Europe position, centered on position 44. 08 north, 049556 west. These are all fishing boats in our area that we have hunted so far. We are continuing to patrol. Canadian Military 0108, this is Cape Roger. Uh, Roger, I have all those, uh, all that activity. I was wondering if, uh, if you pick up any further activity later on, could you contact us then, over? Canadian Military 108, we'll go. This is Cape Roger, clear. Once the location of the Spaniards is known, the Cape Roger wastes little time in getting there. Unlike the first pair we met, these trawlers are taking back, and they're dead in the water. The decision is made to attempt a boarding without calling the Spaniards. The boarding craft is ready. The fisheries officers put on their safety gear. Yeah, basically what we have is uh, floater suits and steel toe boots and a helmet. It's a precaution uh, in case you fall in the water or if you're on board the other vessel, the foreign vessel, with the helmet in case you get struck by loose cables, blocks, tackle, anything. And uh, basically the floater suit will fall in the water. It's not a survival suit. It uh, will keep you warm for a little while, but no great period of time. It's just to keep you afloat. Is it ever, how tricky does it get getting down into that boarding craft? Uh, what kind of weather do you... You go across it. Well, it's depending on the it's depending on the, the boarding itself. If it's a priority boarding, if there is some uh, depends on the wind. Usually, I've boarded in cases where it was 45, 50 mile per hour wind, and uh, sometimes very, very serious and very dangerous. And Bob, how about the boat itself, the, the boarding craft? Uh, the boarding craft is uh, made of uh, fiberglass and rubber pontoons. It also has a double hull. The bottom all fills full of water that uh, give it the stability. Uh, in the boarding craft itself, when we're doing boardings, uh, we have a compass, radar reflectors, and the man on the motor is a navigational man. So in case there's foggy weather or whatever turns up, we got somebody there we can trust. 
The gamble seems to have paid off. The Spanish deckhands get set to lower the boarding ladder. Uh, once when we get to the foreign ship, uh, we request them to put his letter usually on the leeward side to uh, give us some protection in boarding, and usually midships. Uh, we leave the boarding craft by the means of the letter, get on deck, uh, we walk to the bridge, introduce and identify ourselves to the captain. Hello, captain. Hi, my Question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bob Turner. Captain, Captain Bob Turner. Captain, uh, we'd like to complete an inspection on board your vessel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes? Pardon me, yeah. Okay. The Spaniards don't let the inspection interfere with their fishing. They continue the haul back. These two ships, the Monte Conferco and the Monte Galnero, have been at sea for two months. They will return to Spain in another three months. The fisheries officers check the records to see what the ships have taken so far. Hey, Captain, this is your uh, log book? Yeah, yeah. Yes. And uh, you, you were inspected when? Before? Yeah, yeah. June 10th, was that your last inspection? June 10th? Yeah. But the skipper has to provide a fishing log uh, which gives all round weights, all weights recording log car round weight by species. So we could end up having five or six different species there, and these are total at the end of the day. And also he has a production log. What weight is recorded, recorded as production weight, whether it's salted fish, frozen fish. Uh, whether it's frozen fish, it says how it's, how it's produced, whether it's head off, guttered head off, bobtail or whatever production way you do. Is, is language ever a problem? Uh, no, it's not. There may be, if we want to find out uh, other information besides what we're looking for, you know, it's a problem. But usually the captains themselves uh, know what documents we wish to inspect and they're usually ready and waiting for us to open up on this. When you're going to board pier trawlers, uh, do both boats keep records of, of their or the fish? What's their system? No, usually uh, when you go board a pair trawler, you go board the one with that's not flying the flag because um, usually the one flying the flag has got the logbook. So what we our procedure is we go board the one that's not flying the flag. We complete the inspection there, then we go over to the other the other pair, the other vessel of the pair, and complete an inspection on that. Then we also do an inspect the fishing logs and see how much was actually recorded and how much they're actually supposed to have on both vessels. So even though there's two boats, only one keeps the records? Yes. And usually the, the one, the, the vessel that's got the records, it's also got the fishing captain who is in charge of fishing operations for both vessels. After the ship's records are checked, the next step is measuring the mesh in the trawl. That'll have to wait a few minutes as the deckhands complete the haulback. When the net is empty, the other trawler will come alongside and pick up its cable, and the pair will be ready to fish again. Well, the, the fishing gear uh, is usually the hotter trawl, bottom hotter trawl right now. Uh, to measure that, we use a, a wedge-shaped gauge uh, marked from 100 millimeters to 155 millimeters. Hooked onto the, or slipped through the end of the gauge, it's a five kilo weight and you suspend the meshes by your fingers and let the weight fall between, between knot to knot. Having checked the mesh and the ship's fishing logs, Bob and John go below to measure the fish hold. Well, when you're measuring the fish hold, uh, it's usually the two of us are to measure how much fish is actually there by measuring the empty space. And uh, we usually get the depth of the hold and and then subtract the empty space and we actually figure out how much fish is in there. 
And then we use conversion factors to convert what production state is in the hole to round weights. So you have some sort of formula that you take the measurement of the hole oh, yes. and yes. figure out how much fish is there? Yes, very much so. Do you usually find that uh, the, the boat's records are accurate? Uh, sometimes. And it depends on the situation. Sometimes they won't even allow us in their hole. It's outside of the 10 mile limit. Uh, they don't, if they're non members, they don't have to. And uh, the ones you usually go aboard are fairly. Once the fish hold is checked, the inspection is over. Guys, have a good trip. Thank you very much, Thank Captain. Very much. Everything has checked out. No violations were found. The mesh was the legal size. The amount of fish in the log books balanced out with the amount of fish in the hold. But maybe that should have been expected. It could be the reason the Spaniards allowed the inspection in the first place. All that's left is the routine business of getting back in the boarding craft and returning to the Cape Roger. Although that's not always routine. A light moment in a serious business and a frustrating business. In September of this year, Less than two months after we filmed this program, Spain finally joined NAFO. But that doesn't seem to have solved a thing. Spain has yet to be given any quotas because they haven't shown that they'll stick to the rules. Just a couple of weeks after Spain joined NAFO, two Spanish trawlers were caught fishing inside the 200 mile limit by the Cape Roger. Instead of heading for St. John's, they headed for the open sea with two fisheries officers still on board. The officers were sent back to the Cape Roger only when the Spaniards were safely outside the zone. Bob Turner and John Taylor weren't on that trip, but they're more than familiar with the frustrations of policing the Grand Banks outside and inside the zone. These fellows now, if they fish inside, they usually fish pretty close to the line so that if, if someone comes up on them, they can get out in a hurry. Fairly close to the line. Uh, if they're inside five, six, seven, eight miles, and not much further than that. Uh, we, we cannot catch everybody. Our patrol by the boat is very limited. Do you think these patrols serve any, any purpose? I mean, are they any use? If, you, if, you, if there is a bit of cheating going on and you, you don't catch that many, do you think there's, there's any purpose of being out here? Very much as a deterrent uh, outside. If we were not patrolling at all along the line, you'd have all the vessels fishing inside the zone. So there wouldn't be a deterrent. Right now, we make our presence known. They don't know when we're coming back. They don't know if we're still in the area, so it keeps them from fishing inside our waters. If, if we just allowed them to fish any time they want inside the zone, they'd uh, there'd be unlimited fishing inside our tunnel mile, and we wouldn't have controls as the way we do now. How would you feel uh, about extending the 200 mile limit to include the tail of the bank, those areas that are outside now? Uh, I feel it'd be good. It would be excellent for for our work and for the protection of the fish in Canada. But right now, our biggest problem is uh, where the 200 mile limit does not include all of the banks. We have to worry about non-members uh, of NAFO who don't have a license to get inside and who do not desire a license. So the biggest thing right now is trying to keep them out. But if we included the uh, extended limit to include all the grand banks, all of the banks would be in Canada. So then we would only have to worry about the license vessel that's in, keeping a check on that. Make your job a lot easier? It would make our job considerably a lot easier.